what I want to do here is to talk obviously mostly about adaptation in the developing world, but I'm also going to touch upon where the, where the private sector fits into all of this, because the private sector has been a group which everybody expects will come up, pull its weight, and do a lot of the, lot of the, the necessary heavy lifting, but almost completely ignores, except again at this particular meeting where I think yesterday we heard somebody say, hey, maybe we could have a whole meeting on just the, what the business community, the private sector is doing in adaptation. Yes, you could here in Australia. It'd be very, very difficult to do that in most other parts of the world at the moment. So let me start. Firstly, one of the questions that I was challenged with in the, in the bank, it was, can we actually demonstrate that very oft-made statement that developing countries are most at risk? Now, I, ref I refused for almost 10 years at the bank to ever develop an index, but I, we did do uh, essentially an analysis of how countries were being affected by current climate risks in the last couple of decades, all countries of the world. And this is the, the outcome. You'll see basically that the developed countries show up there in white, three slots out of, I've forgotten how many, 60 or so slots on that, on that graph. Literally, uh, almost every least developed country appears somewhere on that, that chart. I think it's very clear that at the moment it is the developing countries which are being most affected by climate-related uh, risks. And this has been a major part of the discussions within the bank. It, I think most people have accepted and when I, when I also should say, when I talk about the bank, I really do mean the broader multilateral development community, not just the World Bank, but the other development banks and the other UN agencies involved in this area. But I think all of them accept that adaptation and development must be brought together. The phrase that I like to use is climate resilient development, or in actual fact, I prefer to use the phrase development that is climate resilient, because we need to keep the focus on development. Adaptation or managing a climate risk is a part of a development process. It is not a standalone process. But there, are, there is still a debate going on in this area. Many would argue, look, let's just get on with development. If countries develop quickly and effectively, then many of the climate risks will be handled within that process. This is not saying that you ignore the climate risks altogether, but it becomes a, a component of the far bigger, more important issue. Others argue that no, unless we carry out climate-specific projects, we're never going to have the learning or even the rigor about how to approach some of these, these issues. And I think there's a valid uh, point in that as well. There's also another group out there who see the real approach is to integrate climate resilience with disaster risk management. And in fact, would argue that by bringing the two together, this would be a far more effective way to actually manage the process. There are others out there, and I'm one of them, who says just be cautious about that. The, the two communities and the two sets of goals overlap enormously and can gain enormously by working closely together. But they also must actually understand and respect the differences between those two communities. For example, the, the importance within the climate community of less than disastrous chronic losses due to a changing climate, which the disaster risk community doesn't need to deal with. And now, of course, there's a new idea, which, or new labeling, as some would say, which, which is also seen as the, the way ahead by many people. And I'll, I don't, Mark may be able to tell us more about where this got to in, in Rio, but it's the green economy, and this is the way that's going to bring all of these things together. But there is a huge ongoing debate within all of the development agencies along this, these rounds. And in fact, the World Bank, which every once a year produces a significant policy guiding document uh, called the World Development Report, and each time it's on a particular theme, which they see is critically important for development over the next decade or so. In 2010, that document was on development and climate change. This shows the importance that's there. One of the more surprising and pleasantly surprising things that came up to when I was working in the bank was that we were approached by the League of Arab States to say, we basically want to deal with adaptation across the Arab countries. We're sick of the, dom the dominance of essentially the Gulf states' position on, over mitigation. We are missing out on issues that very much uh, influence us. And I was lucky enough to be engaged in this process over the course of about three, two to three years. Exciting times because the Arab Spring 
sprung up soon afterwards, but uh, a time where um, we saw some ex excellent work coming out of that, that region. I'm going to make one diversion here, and it's something which has frustrated me and many others while working in, in this, this area, and that is the issue of uncertainty. We heard from Neville earlier that you know, this is how the IPCC treats uncertainty. In actual fact, what he showed was how the IPCC treats certainty, but we always refer to it as uncertainty, and this does cause us enormous communication problems, and it's not simply, you know, communication in the sense that what, do the newspaper articles read correctly or whatever. It actually affects whether people are ready to act and prepared to act. Because in the developing world especially, people do not have multiple sources of information. And one thing that has got through to almost everybody though, one is that climate change is occurring, but two, there's a huge amount of uncertainty. And this is an impediment. So I think we have to rethink what we're doing. I mean, as I said earlier, it, it is, we can turn this whole thing around and look at how we deal with what we know and how we communicate what we know in a valid and proper way, which also represents the uncertainty in that, that, that situation. Uh, I'm, we, I'm going to be here in Australia for some weeks, and uh, one thing I'll be missing is a National Academies meeting in uh, Washington, which will be, is overseeing and uh, overlooking the, what is going on in the United States on, on adaptation. The theme of that meeting, three-day meeting, is dealing with uncertainty. And my input back to the organisers has been saying, could we at least have a session or two on what we know? And the response from the organisers has been, yes, we're going to try this, but we think it's going to be equivalent to trying to get volunteers for root canal work, um, because that's not the way the community thinks about this. I'll actually do a Mitt Romney here, except I won't put up $10,000, so 10 might be more my, my packet. But I'll take a bet with anyone prepared to take it on. I will predict or project, whichever phrase you want, the mean global temperature in 2050 more accurately than you can predict the oil price in 2050. Both of them have huge impacts on the development pathway. Now, which one do you think? Is anyone prepared to bet they can do better on the oil price in 2050 than I can do on the global mean temperature? I don't see a taker. Good. <laughs> um, one of the other things we should do is to look at what our colleagues and other disciplines do. And I put this slide up not to take a, a shot at my economist colleagues. I've learnt after 10 years in the bank that's not a safe thing to do. But to actually just to look at how they deal with some of these things. This shows projections which are made quarterly of the GDP in the US by a number of uh, both think tanks, e experts, etc. They're the grey lines there. The red lines are the outputs of some of the, the best models in this area, and the green line is the, I think it's the fit for the grey lines. You'll notice they missed something. <laughs> now, the, the article that this comes out of is a very positive article showing how quickly that mistake was corrected. By six months, they were able to tell you that we're at the bottom, we're down there at minus 6%. Um, and how the models were adjusted to bring this back. But a very, very different approach to dealing with this issue of uncertainty and self-correction, etc. And I think we need to rethink this whole area. Now coming back more into the science. One of the things I've learnt, certainly in, in much of my pleasure, that in during, working with, in the developing countries, is that the IPCC still stands as the authority. Uh, reference to the IPCC, either coming from, from those of us working in development agencies, but also com coming from the developing countries, is simply sets the standard. However, the IPCC reports are becoming virtually unintelligible to most people. In fact, there's a whole industry out there of people reinterpreting IPCC reports, AR4 and the SREX, for, for, for non-IPCC um, experts. Now, I also hear that there is a major program, and I think this is absolutely correct, and I've seen this working very effectively, of, for the IPCC to go out and help communicate this message even better. We need a lot more of that. But we also do need to think about, is the report, as, it's, as it comes out at the moment, really serving the purpose, or is there a need for some other product as well, which will help that translation? 
I'm just showing some of the translations, some of the problems that occur. One of the interpretations of the SREX, which is, uh, has, a, has a strength within the World Bank, is that the SREX concluded that there was no evidence that climate change is affecting uh, the profile of disasters. That conclusion is completely wrong. It's, you know, there, we heard several presentations here at this meeting of the more nuanced uh, interpretation that came through SREX, which I think almost everybody who's looked at this area agrees is the appropriate one. So we've had to therefore go back and dealing with the Arab countries to reinterpret some of these issues. And one thing we show, I show here is one of the, the slides we use, which simply compares the frequency of uh, climatic events compared with the frequency of non-climatic disasters, or climatic disasters, non-climatic disasters, to show that this parting of the ways with time. We see that, that um, the number of uh, volcanoes and earthquakes reported, scaled against it in this way, is increasing as well, but the number of climate-related disasters is increasing even faster. We can break that down in, in, in the uh, Arab area, this one, uh, and show that, in actual fact, what is really increasing is extreme temperatures and floods. Now, this was done at about the time we are doing the Arab League report, and it's interesting to see that the information that came out of that report, analyses done by specialists within the region, um, without reference then to the SREX, they decided the critical issues they were facing were water, water, and water, um, particularly as flash floods and as extreme heat. In fact, one of the surprising issues we found was that uh, in some parts of the Gulf states, it is, like, it is already becoming impossible for have people working during daylight hours outdoors uh, in, in the hottest part of the year. With the projections we have at the moment, it could be that it'll be impossible to work in evening hours, which is where they've shifted to now uh, in, in the near future. And these are considerably concerning issues for them. There is also some good news out there. One is that we are starting to deal with what, I guess, what some of us would call the adaptation deficit. What we've seen over the, the last few decades is an enormous reduction in the number of deaths attributed to climate-related disasters. The red line there, you can see that it is, it is essentially plateaued uh, at a very low level since about 1990. Now, a lot of this comes about because large countries like India, uh, Ethiopia, etc., have introduced safety nets, which really essentially mean now that people don't die during droughts, etc. Um, of course, it does depend on reporting. Uh, you no longer report them dying of starvation during a drought, but they may still be dying of other diseases associated with the poor conditions, but that's a problem of data. The other thing to look at is the number of people affected. Essentially, again, that has plateaued in the last few decades as well. Now, it is clear, I think, that, people, we, that we are getting bet better at managing the impacts of disasters. But I think our control of this is still very, very fragile. So there's no, no reason whatsoever to let up. And future climate change is going to make that challenge even, even more difficult. I now want to move to slightly, we're still on the issue of how to get science into this development agenda, and just talk about some of the technical analyses that are done in developing uh, projects. This is an unusual project. It's in China, and China was borrowing $600 million from the World Bank. Why China would need to borrow $600 million from the World Bank is an interesting question in its own right. They also, and it was to look at how to improve the, uh, uh, essentially the productivity of their main food bowl, which is around the Beijing area. The, the, the 3H river basins. Um, part of this, which was paid for by the GEF with a $4 million grant, um, was on adaptation. China, along with the rest of the G77, says they will not spend money on adaptation in their country until the negotiations agree on an appropriate funding mechanism. Hence, they had to go to the GEF to get extra money. They did put in kind support into this. Uh, to match the $4 million were about $20 to $60 million, but they were not spending any of their own money directly on adaptation, so they say. But a huge analysis was done. Basically, a, a set of models were, were patched together, some of them coming out of the scientific community, the, the standard crop productivity models, and some of the water flow models and water distribution models. They were linked with the allocation routines that are used in China at the moment to actually do water allocation, and then linked with the routines which are actually 
control how food is distributed around China and then linked with global models of the agricultural product markets. These were put together and the result that came out was of potentially huge importance. Basically, if we were just to stay with the, the, the standard crop yield models, the projections are that across all the crops grown in that region, we would see about a minus 9% or a 9% fall in crop production across the region. When you allow for the fact of the competition for water in that region at the same time, that could go to 10% fall or even more. However, when you take into account the basic market response that will occur through the existing system in China in reallocating um, and encouraging, by whatever means, people to change their cropping patterns, that falls to minus uh, just a 4% loss of pr production. And when you take the global response into account, and China actually would actually be at an advantage across the rest of the world, it, that falls to 2% reduction. Now, this is an extremely important result um, in, in any uh, uh, terminology. However, will this appear in the next IPCC report? I doubt it. The reason being that the management of this project was patchy because it was managed by non-experts in this area. It was managed by a changing team. Uh, I believe the results are actually do reflect uh, the situation, but it would be very, very difficult to justify in the scientific literature. And this is one of the problems, that designing projects is pragmatic. And I also agree with Richard Klein's call for a much more rigorous approach to adaptation. We do need this. We need to clarify our thinking. But don't be misled. If we get involved in this area, and this is where we must become involved, it's going to be messy out there. And we have to work out ways of actually maintaining quality control in those, those particular conditions. One attempt to do this was a number of us in the, in the in development banks basically said, look, if we are going to integrate climate resilience into development planning, we have to have some sort of substantial piloting program to learn how to do this. There's no clear way of going about it. We need to trial this in a number of countries, see what works, see what's appropriate for certain types of countries. I must admit, I was expecting we might be able to get $100 million or so to do this in, in across, say, 10 countries. We ended up with a billion dollars. A billion dollars which the donors wanted, or sorry, the contributors, I should say, wanted planned, designed, and dispersed in three years. Um, so there was a challenge there. I mean, just to find the human technical resources to do that planning and designing was very, very difficult. They had their reasons for this. They wanted to be able to present preliminary results in Copenhagen, final results maybe in Cancun or Durban, and lead into to Rio. The reality of, trying, of working in this particular area. OK, when we talk about all of this, there is somebody missing, somebody missing in action. The international focus has been on the negotiations and, and that has all sorts of both positive and negative influences on getting adaptation done. There's a focus on more and more, even still on more and more assessments and capacity building exercises. I wish we could do more about capacity maintenance exercises. Governments are calling for less detailed design and just give them budgetary support to carry out their programs. We are seeing a lot of action on the ground, usually sponsored by NGOs, um, usually very small scale, and mostly with almost no chance of being scaled up to an effective size. So how do we go about, where's the missing player? And personally, I think one of the missing players, one of the most important, is the private sector. And here, I don't just refer to the Coca-Colas, the Caterpillars, but the individual farmer coming, out, emer coming into an emerging market is private sector. You can't get any more private than the way these people have to manage their lives. How do we actually help them? And that, to me, has been one of the challenges. What is it that we can do to get the private sector more engaged? Unfortunately, the discussion has so far centred far too much on where do they fit in terms of philanthropy. And what we're trying to say to the private sector is, you have to protect your assets. You have to protect your supply lines. You have to protect your customers and they're, they're, they're your value added chains there. And this is what we're trying to do. When we look at what the private sector is doing, it is still relatively little. Even the big players like PepsiCo, which have a, a very good track record in sustainability, in water management, only come at this indirectly. For example, I know you can't read this, but um, if you go through one of their reports, we find one of the few references directly to saying, the impact of climate change is also uh, affecting our operations. How does that come about? Because droughts in, in Brazil meant they had to source 
orange juice from Florida. Florida orange growing uses more water, and that meant that Pepsi did not meet their water targets that year. That's the only way they discussed climate change in this whole, whole process. What we've done within the Gain Institute, and I'll be very brief about this, is to develop an index, something I'd avoided doing in the bank for 10 years, but what we wanted was an awareness raising process, something which would catch people's attention and say, hey, are you thinking about adaptation? Are you thinking about where your country stands in, this, in the rankings? Or are you thinking about this country you're about to invest in, where it stands compared with its, compared with its neighbours? It's a very simple index, um, but what we do, we break it into both a vulnerability and a readiness to receive investment funds. And I think this is what captures the private sector's interest. I won't bother about those, just the detail of what goes into it, um, but we can discuss that in some other context. But the questions we really have is that we have to deal with a whole range of private sector players, from the Bedouin people in those tents who run very small, but they're totally dependent on private operations, through to the date grower there who is an international exporter, who's changing the variety of grapes he grows because he accepts that climate change is occurring, through to uh, the United Arab Emirates who are asking, Mark showed those fantastic plans for those islands, uh, how will they build them if the temperatures get worse? And welcome. when I deal with these developing countries, I've found one thing, and that is there's often a lack of awareness of issues. There's sometimes scepticism about climate change. There is often confusion about climate change. We often heard things, we we're often told, went to one, one particular place in India, we said, have you noticed what's happening to the weather around here? Yes, we're noticing it's drier, et cetera, et cetera. Do you know what the reason is? There was a discussion went around the, the, the group of people, and I could see there was sort of a bewilderment on their face. And finally, they came, the, the spokesperson woman came back to us and said, don't you understand? It's climate change. Don't you, haven't you heard of that? And I think this is a reflection of what goes on in some of these areas. We had the same discussion with these Bedouin tribesmen. They knew about climate change. They were changing their practice. We asked them, what further information do you need to help you make your changes? And the reaction was, well, we know it's going to get hotter. We know the rains are failing. So therefore, we're changing. So again, we have to think about what, how much information is necessary. Are they interested in our detailed analyses of uncertainty? They, ha they know the directions, they see the direction, they want help in actually how to achieve the changes. One thing we don't see there is denial. And this is one thing that worries me at, mo at the moment. In dealing with the private sector in the US, we've been told essentially, look, we're happy to go on talking, but can you wait until after the elections? Nobody wants to go out and be a front runner on adaptation or any, any climate issue in the, in the politically divisive situation within the US at the moment. I hope the same thing doesn't develop here, but whatever happens, development will continue. That development must be climate resilient, and a lot of the adaptation action is going to be there, and I encourage you to become involved. To get effective integration of the science into the development process, four groups must work together. The activity hosts, receiving countries, which is the way you want to look at it, the resource providers, the donors, etc., the task managers who actually bring all these pieces together and get the job done on, on, the, on the ground, and the scientific and technical community. They have to be integrated and work together and understand each other's issues, problems, and ways of working. How do you achieve that? Well, my message in Tucson, this came directly from one of my slides in Tucson, was you have to start crossing the barriers, working together. And in the US, that is still a relatively new and unusual mes message. Here at this meeting, I've found that it's one that probably doesn't need to be said, because I've seen that happening here. And I think that's one of the things we have to protect in this country at the moment. And uh, I look forward to seeing that happen. If you want to follow up any further on the, what the GAIN in the index does, well, there it is. But uh, thank you very much. And I'm really pleased to be back in this